All right. Hello. Let's pray and uh, we'll get started. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we thank and praise you for another day we can get together as family and uh, study this book, The Case for Christ, and talk about it today as we enter a chapter on Jesus and the attributes of God. Uh, bless us through your word by calling to mind uh, the fact that Jesus is God in the flesh for our salvation and all that you've done for us um, to reveal yourself uh, to us in him. Bless and be with us and make us strong and courageous to confess Christ before the nations. We ask in his holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah, so I'm using my laptop today instead of my iPad, and that is, um, so my camera's at a different angle, and annoyingly, I can't get that ceiling light back there behind me like I can on my iPad. So sorry about the ceiling light. Uh, you'll just have to view my halo today. Yeah, I was going to say it looks a little like a halo or some illuminated. Usually, usually and notice that it's very small. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I only have a little bit of righteousness, but that's all in Christ anyway. So there you have it. Yeah. Um, let's get started in chapter nine and uh, the profile evidence for Jesus. Um, a, number, a number of things conspired against me this week, including um, trouble with constant contact. Um, I wrestled it for over an hour this morning and could not um, get it. So unfortunately, I didn't get to do the amount of prep. I've read the chapter, but I didn't get to do the amount of prep I normally can do. So we'll just kind of walk through this chapter together and, uh, and discuss it. And um, that's just uh, something about today, you know, from it's, it all started with constant contact failing and failing. I didn't even know if I was going to be able to get out the um, reminder for worship and uh, the link for the Zoom study. And uh, so that, that started today's uh, catastrophes. But anyway, we, we will deal with this. Page 231 in the book, The Case for Christ, by Lee Strobel. Um, and he's going to talk to the eighth, uh, the eighth interview is going to be with Donald Carson, PhD. Dr. Carson, um, I got a little confused last week with the previous guy and substituted this. Uh, Dr. Carson is a, a renowned um, New Testament exegete. Um, one of his uh, books, and I think it's listed at the end, is required reading at the seminary for um, Greek exegesis. And I'm looking through for further evidence. Um, it's not listed here because that would be helpful. Um, it's probably listed in uh, the regular text. Um, yeah, Exegetical Fallacies, I think, is the name of the required book. But anyway, Carson is well known. He also participated uh, with a guy named Morris and um, another guy named Moo, M-O-O, on an exegetical textbook that's required at the seminary also. He's, he's very, very well, well known. He is reform in his theology, and uh, we can deal with that. And, uh, and yet is, is super well respected also in sacramental circles. So um, his um, kind of mini biography and his many accomplishments are listed in that first section. Let's go over to 232 and start getting into kind of the meat of the matter. It's called Living and Forgiving Like God um, near the bottom of the page. So uh, Strobel says, my initial question uh, centered on uh, why Carson thinks Jesus uh, is God in the first place? Um, what did he say or do? I asked. What convinces you that he is divine? I wasn't sure how he would respond. Well, uh, he should have been <laughs> if he did his research. Um, although I anticipated he would focus on Jesus' supernatural feats, and I was wrong. Uh, one could point to such things as miracles, Carson said, as he leaned back in the comfortably upholstered chair, but other people have done miracles, or at least appeared to, right? Um, so, uh, uh, so while this may be indicative, it's not decisive. Of course, the resurrection was the ultimate vindication of his identity. That's absolutely true. Um, but of the many things he did, one of the most striking to me is his forgiving of sin. This is on point. This is exactly. Um, if you want to know and understand Jesus as God in the flesh, um, yes, especially in John, he point blank says, I'm God, I'm God, I'm God. Uh, but honestly, um, it is 
uh, even more clear in his forgiving of sin, because only God can do that. Remember what David says in Psalm 51, against you, you only have I sinned. Well, he had sinned against Uriah the Hittite. He got him killed. Uh, he had sinned against Bathsheba. Uh, he had sinned against a whole bunch of people, but ultimately our sin offends God. And, and the idea of for, for example, sin is lawlessness. Who made that law? God. See, so no matter who else we sin against, it's kind of first and foremost against um, God. And so this is a huge point that Jesus goes around forgiving sins. Um, other people don't do that unless they're doing it in the name of God. Jesus straight up says, I forgive you. He's God. It's a huge, it's a huge point. And it's easy to overlook for us, if you've been Christian a long time, you just sort of naturally assume Jesus will be forgiving sin because we've always seen that. Um, but but it, it is point blank him being God. That's why, in fact, in fact, the miracles that he did, you know, and Jesus even says at one point, the signs that he does, the miracles that Jesus did were only done to point to him being God and able to forgive sin. But Jesus didn't come to fix our boo-boos. Uh, he came to forgive us, which is something that only God can do. Uh, and that's what Carson um, gets into. In fact, he mentions David on 233 uh, in, in the middle. Um, and look toward the two-thirds of the way down the page. It's the uh, second to last full paragraph. So along comes Jesus and says to sinners, I forgive you. The Jews immediately recognize the blasphemy of this. See, even his enemies know what he's trying to do. They react by saying, who can forgive sins but God alone? To my mind, that's one of the most striking things Jesus did. Um, and and they, they, they knew and remember why Jesus went to the cross. Uh, it was, in fact, blasphemy. That was the charge against him. Sure, in John, they end run that by sort of by, uh, by saying, well, because Rome doesn't care. So they have to say, well, you're no friend of Caesar if you don't get rid of this guy. They kind of go that route. But ultimately, it is blasphemy that, that, uh, that is the charge uh, against him. Um, along comes Jesus over on 234, first full paragraph. Along comes Jesus who can say with a straight face, which of you can convict me of sin? Uh, if I said that, my wife and children and all who know me would be glad to stand up and testify, whereas no one could with respect to Jesus. So there's moral perfection and the forgiveness of sins are evidence um, of the attributes of God, uh, which are present in Jesus, who is God um, and man. Um, what what do you think about, well, I have multiple questions, but I'd like to just kind of know in general, is this something you would say you ever really stopped and thought about, that the fact that, oh, oh like the guy on the mat, the paralytic on the mat, um, stand up, pick up your mat and walk, and, um, and, and actually it happens at least one other miracle as well, where Jesus wants to know kind of you know, is it easier to say I heal you or is it easier to say I forgive you? Fine, to show that I have power to forgive sins. You know, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Um, do you ever really think about the fact that he's forgiving sins right and left is a demonstration that he's God? I, I will say I will I will say that there is one thing that, that I haven't thought about, and I, and I think that I, I think that's fascinating in two ways. One is that um, you know, even in the Old Testament, it, it doesn't occur to me. I know that there's a lot of, you know, the Levitical system and a lot of the things that, um, uh, you know, sort of metaphorically and really that God is affecting in the lives of his people are sort of implicitly for forgiveness. But, you know, it seems like most of the Psalms and stuff are things like turn your faces, turn your face away from my iniquity. And it's never really like, you know, I forgive you until Jesus you know, comes and says stuff like that. And I've, I've never really kind of thought about that dichotomy because, you know, it seems like the prophets, usually they are there to sort of speak God's word of things like mercy generally and, you know, vengeance generally mm -hmm. and things like that. But it, it is kind of interesting about Jesus specifically, like personally, yeah. I forgive you. And, and I never really thought about that in that sense. Um, the other thing though, that I never really thought about ever, except, except in the reverse, is that, like what you said, all sins are sins against God. 
And typically when we, I mean, when I think of forgiveness, I think of my sin that I've done against other people, right? But I never really tend to think about the sin that other people have done against me or the things that have been wrong against me. God taking the initiative to forgive people for the wrongs they've done against me. And I've never really thought about it like, hey, you can't forgive them for that thing that they did to me. I, it just doesn't really enter my mind, but that's literally what's happening is that God is forgiving so kind of on your behalf, whether you're honestly, whether you're willing to or not. And if you think about sins that you've done against other people that are really wrong, like stuff that they might still hold a grudge or that they might say, I do not forgive you for that. God gets in the middle of that relationship and says, well, you know, you're forgiven as far as I'm concerned. And you know, that forgiveness from somebody else isn't really necessary for that to happen. And so I've never really thought about it from that standpoint is that the forgiveness that other people are getting or for forgiveness that whether I give it to people or not, you know, God is already forgiving the sins that were affronted against me personally. And I don't really have a say as to whether or not they're forgiven for that. Does that make sense? I've never really thought right. about that in those terms. Yeah. One of the two things, uh, one is that um, you have, for example, in second Chronicles, if my people who are called by my name would turn from their wicked ways and, uh, and uh, um, turn toward God's face and turn from their wicked ways and, and pray, God would hear from heaven for, and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. And, um, and, and so that's something, yeah, that only God can do. The second thing is yes, that's something that I always tell the people who are carrying a grudge and having trouble and are wrestling with that is how dare we, and I, I pretty diplomatic about it, but I mean, how dare we not forgive what has been forgiven? How dare we not forgive what Christ has paid for? Um, that's right. Yeah. Lance, did you have something you wanted to? Yeah. Uh, doesn't it depend in part on <clears throat> the actual definition of forgiveness? God's forgiveness is probably different than ours. Um, so, yeah. So to, to forgive our sins um, is to... Uh, have us no longer, like uh, Romans 8, 1 from the sermon today, we are no longer under the condemnation of, of the law. Um, and so it's not that the thing disappeared, didn't matter or whatever, but that Christ died for that. So you have that uh, beautiful line, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints in the Psalms. And it's not precious because there's something inherently precious about us, although God does value us that way, but because Christ died for us, thus that makes the death precious as that person transitions to glory. Um, we tend to forgive, um, but maybe not always forget, or uh, tend to forgive with um, some strings attached, or uh, it is very difficult to forgive uh, as God forgives. Um, and um, kind of along with that, we want to bring to mind the Lord's Prayer and Jesus' statement immediately after. The Lord's Prayer says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And then right after that, Jesus says, you know, what, you know, you will be forgiven. Essentially, you will be forgiven in the way that you forgive others. So if you don't forgive others, you will not be forgiven. Um, which, which is, wow, and that's why that portion of the Lord's Prayer is a little bit hard to, uh, to chunk out there without choking on it a little bit. Forgive us our sins. That part's easy, but as we forgive those who sin against us, uh-oh, <laughs> we basically just told God, forgive me like I forgive others. Wow. It's pretty intense. Did you have more in mind, Lance? Yes, I actually did. I thought um, maybe. I was thinking, though, that is God's forgiveness unconditional in the sense that when Jesus says, go and sin no more, uh, to me, that's conditional. What if she didn't go and sin no more? Right. Yeah. Is, is she still forgiven? So God's forgiveness is conditional because Jesus had to die for that. Um, so the, in other words, it's not just, oh, well, you broke my law. Oh, well, uh, nope. Uh, Jesus literally had to suffer and die for that. So God's 
forgiveness is in Christ. It's always conditional. With regard to go and sin no more, Jesus doesn't have to die on the cross again for that, uh, but rather she turns in faith and repents and receives the forgiveness um, that is won for her on the cross. And it works that way for us as well, because go and sin no more is for every one of us. Um, every time, you know, the, there's the, and, and maybe that ought to be part of the absolution in the, in the divine service. Uh, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and go and sin no more. <laughs> but I know why it's not there because we have, it's a Lutheran thing. You have to end on the gospel. It's a, it's a Lutheran thing. And if you don't do that, um, the, the potluck cake falls, the jello uh, suddenly congeals, and the potato salad gets up and walks away. So you, you have to end on the gospel or bad things happen. But um, that's how Jesus ends. Neither do I forgive you. Go and sin no more. <laughs> and I, I, I'm awfully tempted to think about whether or not that ought to come right after the absolution. But I, I suspect there may be some loud, or maybe not so loud, but some gasping uh, in, in the pews. <laughs> and so, uh, what? But that's really literally what is meant anyway, whether I say it or not. That would be a good, a good point to raise that... Um, if, if you said beforehand you were going to do that, and by the way, that's the subject for the sermon today. Yeah. Uh, that might soften the blow somewhat. Well, that and blaming you for it and saying Lance wanted this. It would be great. I could pass that buck. You take the arrow through the head. We're all good, right? Yeah. <laughs> but no, but really, um, that really, and this is such an important point because guys will you know, verbally, you know, go to blows on social media over this. Uh, you have to end on the gospel. Um, everything about how preaching is taught, it's certainly in St. Louis, everything about how, or, or was taught when I was there, I suspect it still is because I still hear that it is. Everything about how preaching was taught was you have, to the point where guys would literally compose sermons that were the first half, half law, second half gospel, end on the gospel. But end on the gospel was pounded into our heads. Scripture doesn't do that. Many, many sermons of Christ himself, but also in uh, other writings of the New Testament, flat out end. Uh, and usually, New Te usually Paul's epistles end on law. Okay, you're forgiven in Christ. Now, here's what you're supposed to do. da 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 da, -da. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a Lutheran thing. It's, it's more St. Louis than Fort Wayne thing. It's not a bad idea, um, but it can, depending on how you do it, can contribute to some antinomianism. Um, Michael, yes. Oh, I just, I was going to piggyback on what you were saying there about the ending the public absolution uh, and it made me think of some problems with the public absolution in which a pastor cannot know his hearer. Like our, our private confession and absolution, you know whether or not you can end on the gospel because you know if your hearer is ready for the gospel. Right. Uh, with this generic public absolution, you're just kind of throwing it out there as a blanket. Uh, and unfortunately, that was introduced, I think, as a remedy because nobody was ever showing up for private confession and absolution. So we exacerbated the problem by doing public confession and absolution. So now even fewer people show up for the private absolution. Uh, so you're kind of forced to end on the gospel when maybe most of your hearers aren't ready for that. Yeah, um, well, um, yeah. So a couple of things there. Um, one is that um, the public confession and absolution um, became a function of growing churches and churches becoming so large that it became logistically impractical for the whole congregation to come to pastor's house on Saturday and confess. There just were simply too many people. But also, um, it, it also was addressing the fact that fewer and fewer people seemed inclined to do that, and therefore they were not receiving the sacrament for long periods of time. 
Um, there's that. Um, yes, it's definitely um, become the trend that almost no one confesses privately um, anymore, although it's always available. It's offered. I speak about it uh, regularly every so often, and uh, it's still not ever um, used, although people do make appointments and do come and talk about things that trouble them, which ends up coming out as confession and absolution, even when it wasn't intended, uh, maybe originally. So it sort of happens, but you're, you're right on a lot of those counts. Yeah. Uh, on, on, on all of those things that you said. Um, also, um, the, um, you're right that the, you're right that the, um, public confession and absolution has this huge drawback of not actually being able to minister directly to an individual and their individual concerns and sins and knowing that when the law has done its work so that the application of the gospel comes next, but rather it is, okay, we're gonna pray this prayer together. We're going to, through that prayer as a community, confess our sinfulness and as a community, seek absolution both as a community and as individuals, and then that's announced. Um, but yeah, the go and sin no more is always a part of what Jesus says. And of course, you also run the risk if you start saying go and sin no more every Sunday, that people get so used to hearing it that they ignore it anyway. So there are all of these, the flesh just constantly presents hurdles to ministry. Yeah. Lance, you're, I can see you on a... No, I was going to comment okay. that, you know, historically, I can remember growing up and even in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, there was a lot of emphasis on law. And I recall when that uh, changed, when uh, it was determined that we do need to spend more time with gospel. And hence, I recall that even in college uh, at Concordia, where we were told, be sure that you give as much emphasis to, to gospel as you do to law. Wow, that's really helpful. Um, do you decade wise can you plant that somewhere in a in a decade because i'm curious about something that happened i would guess it's about the 60s okay thanks that's hugely helpful um because then um then you have by the end of the 90s at least um a a because so i went to the seminary second career guy uh, finished, had to finish some college first, 99, and then uh, enrolled in 99 in pre-seminary classes and stuff. So really 2000 really got started. And by that time, there was a big concern about antinomianism in the, the Lutheran church that now the law had been so de-emphasized that um, people were, some, some pastors were actually telling people or were suggesting that uh, Lutherans don't need to hear the law. They're already saved. They just need the forgiveness of their sins. They already know. Yeah, that, that really helps me understand historically what was going on by the time I got to seminary and why I found what I found. Because I, I have tended to follow um, pastors of the generation before me who, who generally speaking, were, were very light on law and very heavy on gospel. And I wondered what has been going on, you know? Oh man, does that clear things up? We're just trying to, we're, we're trying to find the middle of the road by weaving. <laughs> and, and I did see too, where the pendulum then swung too far to the, the gospel, at, you know, and we have to find that middle ground. Yeah. That is so incredibly helpful. That's, I mean, that is just huge because I still deal today. Obviously, you know, there still are pastors around from the generation before me. And invariably, in kind of dealing, I, I'm invariably kind of, what happened here? What's, you know, where, where did the law go? And why are things uh, like this? Or they will make a comment. Um, if you start talking about the use, in the, the use, the proclamation of law, and, and almost any kind of suggestion that that should be there, they kind of come in very quickly with, well, you know, you don't want to be too heavy. Now I know why. That was a thing. You know, that was a, we had a problem with being too heavy on law. And so a generation of pastors was trained to really watch for that and lighten on that. And then 
So, so then the next generation says, well, you know, we need to pull this back a little. Okay. Wow, is that helpful? That is huge. You get today's scholar points. <laughs> the, the glitter is falling from heaven. Doodly -doo, doodly -doo, doodly -doo. You know, yeah, very good. All right, super cool. Uh, let's move on on uh, 234 to the mystery of the incarnation. And I'm so glad he uses the word mystery because the New Testament does not use the word um, sacrament, it uses mystery. And it came from a mysterion in the Greek uh, into, uh, you know, sacra and various va variations of sacred uh, in, uh, in Latin, sacrament, but they are called divine mysteries um, in scripture. And maybe they did that to separate things that are mysteries like the incarnation from things that are sacraments, you know, like baptism and Lord's Supper. Although we're still really talking about the same kind of thing, aren't we? God working um, through material things to accomplish forgiveness. And that is the incarnation, right? So um, using some notes I brought along, Strobel says, I hit Carson in rapid fire succession with some of the biggest obstacles to Jesus' claim of deity. Dr. Carson, how in the world could Jesus be omnipresent if he couldn't be in two places at once, I asked. How could he be omniscient when he says, not even the Son of Man knows the hour of his return? How could he be omnipotent when the Gospels plainly tell us he was unable to do many miracles in his hometown? Let's first, uh, at the, as we kind of read into this, start w wading into the pool here. Uh, let's deal with omnipresent because I'm fascinated. Um, I'm fascinated by the question, you know, how could Jesus be omnipresent? In other words, the question wants Jesus to be omnipresent. If he can't be in two places uh, at, at once, well, first of all, Jesus ascended into glory. But what's he say at the end of Matthew? And lo, I will be with you always to the end of the age. So clearly, Jesus thinks he can be in two places at once, right? He can ascend into heaven and be seated at the right hand of the Father and be with you always to the end of the age. And this is an approach I take with reform, with people who are reform in their theology and who have been trained against sacraments and have been trained to abstract them and conceptualize them and rationalize them and submit them to human uh, authority. Um, what do you think about that, uh, the question, how can he be um, omnipresent when he can't be in two places at once. What do you think about that? Uh, Michael? Oh, you're muted, buddy. I think it was Lance you were hearing. I, I, Michael raised his hand. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, yes, I was muted. There you go. Uh, yeah. So first, I would address Strobel's assertion that uh, the Bible is arguing against Christ's divinity. It doesn't do so just because it's arguing for his humanity, right? Right. And uh, your uh, your keying on the word mystery, I think, is uh, is is great because the scriptures even tell us that even the angels long to peer into this mystery of the incarnation, right? Yeah. Even the angels don't don't get this. So how can we expect to possibly understand how how the infinite can, can cloak itself in the finite. Uh, right. yeah, it, it is a profound mystery. It's not one that, that we think that I think we really can answer, uh, but simply something that, that faith must accept, right? Right, and I'm glad you brought up that quote. Um, Calvin said, uh, the finite cannot contain the infinite, uh, and that which would rule out the incarnation. And he, his argument was against the real presence uh, but, uh, but again, you know, the incarnation is, is God dwelling among his people and being really present. So uh, that's great that you brought that up. Yeah, good point. Yeah, Lance? On a, on a secular basis, uh, a more real world basis, uh, I was going to do that, but I heard my mother telling me not to do it. Uh, now, is my mother present? No, but in one sense, yes, she is, because I heard her saying that to me. Um, 
and you know that I shouldn't do whatever it is that I was about to do. Um, and and in in a man, in a very real sense, I can hear Pastor Tony say that's not a good thing to do. Oh, uh, and so in a sense, are you present? No, you're not in the room with me, but you are present in me, so to speak. And we have in uh, John eight, uh, we have um, before Abraham was, I am, um, which goes to Christ being. Um, eternal and yet standing right in front of them and being present uh, with Abraham. Remember, it's the Malach Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, a pre-incarnate Christ that stops the hand of Abraham present to him, present, standing in flesh in front of his um, detractors. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, Troubling only to people, again, who don't really know the scriptures, the whole idea of omnipresence in flesh. Um, and, and it may be, it may again be a function of we've been so close to it for so long that we just accept it and, and don't really worry about it or, or think about it. But, um, but yeah, Jesus can be present in locus and omnipresent, and that's something only God can do. Um, but certainly a Jesus who can say, standing there to the apostles, I'll be with you always to the end of the age, then ascend into heaven, but still be present, uh, can be really present in the Eucharist. Um, yeah, abs absolutely. So what do you think about that? Do you encounter uh, people who really struggle with uh, how can Christ's body and blood be there in, with, and under the bread and wine for the forgiveness of sins? You, you bump into that? What do people say? I don't think I've run into that personally, although I do wonder, um, I don't know if this is like the converse of that and if it's instructive or helpful in this sense, but I, I wonder, um, you know, of course, we, we understand the, the real presence of uh, the body and blood of Christ in, in the sacraments, but um, I get this is like the, the reverse of this, but I, I wonder about the distinction between something like that or something like what Christ has said about his presence in our lives as distinct from something like panentheism or pantheism. Right. Um, you know, and how, because I think people do have trouble with that, at least the way that they behave or the way that they kind of think about things. I think that is, you know, and, and like I said, I realize this might be the flip side of the immediate topic, but I, I wonder if there's a relationship there. Yeah, there is. No, yeah, it is. It is related. Um, pantheism is many gods. Panentheism is God is in everything. And um, you'll, uh, or, God or gods are in everything, I should say. Yeah, because then you get into uh, the whole, uh, you know, tree worship thing or the spirits in the river. Animism. Um, animism is the idea that there are spirits everywhere and usually it takes the form of nature spirits, although um, Shinto is, um, this, uh, is heavily focused on ancestor spirits and, and leaving shrine gifts and having a shrine in your home, but leaving shrine gifts, including food to appease the ancestor spirits. So I don't play tricks on you. Um, but but um, there was a story I heard years ago um, from, in a missionary context of a, of a village next to a river. The river had done a lot of flooding and people were literally throwing the last of their you know, chickens and rice and whatever they had to eat, throwing it into the river, um, knowing that they would then go hungry, but thought that the hunger they would feel um, still was a better outcome than having the river spirit be upset with them and continue flooding. Um, and it started causing starvation in the village, um, that kind of thing. But yeah, yeah, pantheism, there are many gods. Panentheism, God is in everything, then becomes God is everything and starts becoming the worship of things, trees, rocks, spirits, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. Is it, is it worth making the distinction and, and saying that Yahweh is the God of all things, of all creation, but not in all things, and is where he says he is? Yeah, um, so, um, right. Things exist, whether visible or invisible, by God's permission. So Yahweh is creator of all things, is sovereign, 
And um, scripture tells us, you know, moment by moment, things only exist. And then Paul writes, in him, we live and move and have our being, right? So he's, he is omnipresent. Um, and he is the cause of material reality and the cause of its ongoing existence moment by moment. And uh, we hear of the word in John 1 that um, all things were made through him. And apart from him, nothing exists that has been made. Um, so that is helpful to remember. But the, God's indwelling in us is very different than panentheism. You know, we wouldn't say, well, God's in that dresser. In the, and certainly the dresser exists by God's permission. But when, when Jesus says, I will be with you to the end of the age, or that we will come and make our home in him, that is a completely different thing um, than panentheism. Um, that is God's promise that his, his life will occupy us and will be our life and hold us, uh, hold us over, hold us, if you will, until uh, we receive uh, life eternal in Christ. So there is a distinction there, and it is important to make, and it is different than panentheism, and it's very important for us to communicate that because Eastern philosophy is, uh, for whatever reason, uh, very attractive in America, and it's something that um, since at least the 1960s has been of increasing um, hobby interest and maybe even more uh, in America. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. All right. Um, so that deals with omniscience. Um, now we know according to his humanity, right? According to his humanity, he can't be in more than two places at once. Um, because that's, you know, humans, humans can't do that. Uh, but we always remember that Jesus is true God and true man. And uh, that he sometimes, uh, while there is only one Jesus, um, acts according to his divinity and acts according to his humanity, or according to his humanity says that the Father is greater than I. He says that. Um, and yet at the same time, the divinity is only voluntarily um, subdued, submitted, and held back, but it, but, it is, but it is always present there. So according to his humanity, he can't be in two places at once. According to his divinity, that's not a problem. That's something God can do. Um, how can he be omniscient when he says, not even the Son of Man knows the hour of his return? What would you say to that? Yeah. yeah. What would you say to, to that question, uh, that statement that not even the Son of Man knows the hour of his return? If that is being made as an argument uh, against omniscience. Is he talking about himself or is he talking about man? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's talking about himself. Yeah, not even the son of man. Uh, so that's that Daniel 7 title for the Messiah knows the hour of his um, return. Well, what, when he says the son of man, it seems to me he's emphasizing his humanity. Right. And as a human, he didn't know. Right. Of course, as a God, he would, but as a human, he didn't. Right. Yes. That would be my thought, too. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And that's exactly. And that goes along with that idea also that he can't be in two places at once according to his humanity or the father is greater than I according to his humanity. Uh, there also is this functional order in the economy of the Trinity. Um, where the Father is greater than the Son, and both the Father and the Son send forth the Spirit who proceeds from them, uh, and so forth. The Son is begotten eternally of the Father, but the Spirit isn't. The Spirit proceeds. Um, and the idea also that the Son, remember, is the speaking of God. And um, so if the Father has chosen in his wisdom not to have spoken that, um, so then certainly according to the divine, the divine wisdom, we would expect Jesus to know that. And yet this, the father hasn't spoken that. He has, has reserved that. So that doesn't in any way restrict Jesus' divinity. It doesn't in any way discount it uh, or make it somehow lower. That would be Arianism anyway. Um, but just helps us understand the relationship of the persons uh, or what we would call the economy of, of the Trinity, how they interact um, with each other. Yeah. Um, how could he be omnipotent 
when the gospels plainly tell us that he was unable to do many miracles in his hometown. What was that about? In his hometown of Nazareth, where no prophet is respected in his hometown, um, it says that Jesus was unable to do any miracles there. What do you make of that? Is it possible that the word unable is a limitation of the English language? Uh, unable covers a whole wide spectrum of, sit of situations. And when you say he's unable, well, in English, you could be saying, well, he just thought he couldn't do it there. He chose not to, or, or. He was ineffective. Yeah, I mean, just, and it can mean that he is not physically able to, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So I think it may be a limitation as similar to the limitations in English that we have for Jesus, do you love me? When Jesus says, do you love me? All right, good. My Anybody thought know? was. Uh -huh, go ahead. My thought was because of their unbelief. Because of Not their that he unbelief. wasn't able, but that um, it's like their unbelief just kind of stopped him in his tracks, um, so to speak. I'm looking up the Greek, and I'm also agreeing while you're while you're speaking. It it strikes me that um you know this this actually came up in some of the earlier chapters in the case for Christ, where you know it, it kind of talked about the you know why would the, the the apostles include stuff in Scripture that was not in a positive light for them, or that would cause people to kind of look upon them unfavorably. I, I think there's something here to the fact that that passage is included, something for us to specifically consider. Um, because if, if there were a limitation of deity or if there was a situation where, well, nope, Jesus couldn't, just couldn't make it happen. Just sorry, guys, you know, couldn't, couldn't do it. Um, you would think that if this were a fabrication, that there would be no mention of anything like that. Uh, so just the fact that it's present, I think, um, points us towards something. And, and I think as, uh, Lance and Donna and Alicia have, have sort of all mentioned that, you know, um, I mean, I mean, Christ ministered to all kinds of people, but he was chiefly there for his people, right? Which he even said to, um, uh, as with the Samaritan woman, I think it was. So we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And um, Christ also knows the hearts of people and whether showing any form of authority there is going to do them any good or, or make any difference to them. And, and I think Lance is onto something with respect to you know, what the actual meaning behind that is, is, is probably not the way that we would formulate it in our modern speech. Yeah. So the word comes from uh, uh, dunamai, uh, the verbal form, to be able or to have power. Um, so it is, and it's a primitive verb form, and it literally means um, to be able or to have power and the negative form and the negative particle does precede it means literally not able yeah and not able was he there um poi uh -oh, to do poi uh, poi a side to do not any work of power if not on a few sick, so he did heal some sick, a few. Having laid the hands, he healed. Uh, verse six, and um, et thou mezai, um, thou mazo, to be amazed. Uh, by the way, uh, thaumaturgy is uh, magic. Uh, so thou mazo, to be uh, amazed, to be magic. And he was amazed. Uh, dia because of uh, apistion, the unbelief of them. Uh, so what Alicia has homed in on here is uh, that, and I, I mentioned earlier, that Jesus only did miracles to prove he had the power to forgive sin, that he had the authority and power to forgive sin. So in his hometown where they refused to believe in him and they're they're talking about, well, wait a minute, isn't this the carpenter's son? Don't we know his brothers and sisters, blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, who, who does this guy think he is? Um, Jesus is um, unable, not because of some inherent lack of divinity, but he's unable to do miracles there because they would only accuse him of being a trickster and pulling a stunt versus having it affirmed for them that he is the Messiah of God with authority to forgive sins. Does that make sense? Um, that's what you at least just homed in on there. And that's, that's what's going on. So to sit for, for the Bible to say, and it, it does say unable um, to do, doesn't mean a lack of ability, a lack of potential. Doesn't mean that there's not a, that, that, that there is a lack of potential, but it means that the outcome would not be what he wants. Therefore, he cannot produce that outcome. So therefore, he will not uh, do the works. Well, except he healed a few sick people. <laughs> I, love, I love that that is, that is thrown in there. Yeah. He didn't do anything huge. He just healed a few sick people, you know, because of their un unbelief. Yeah. All right, very good. Um, let's proceed then on 234. Uh, pointing my pen at him for emphasis, I concluded by saying, let's admit it, the Bible itself seems to argue against Jesus being God. Well, then Carson will give um, his, uh, his answers. Um, while Carson didn't flinch, he did concede that these questions have no simple answers. Well, they kind of do. Uh, after all, they strike at the very heart of the incarnation, God becoming man, spirits taking on flesh, the infinite uh, becoming finite, uh, the eternal becoming time-bound. Um, it's a doctrine that has kept theologians busy for centuries. That's true, for centuries. Uh, and that's where Carson chose to start his answer by going back the way schol to the way scholars have tried to respond through the years. Historically, there have been two or three approaches, he said. Okay? For example, at the end of the last century, the great uh, theologian Benjamin Warfield worked through the Gospels and ascribed various bits either to Christ's humanity or to his uh, deity. When Jesus does something that's a reflection of him being God that's ascribed to Christ's deity, when there's something reflecting his limitations or a finiteness or his humanness, for example, his tears, you know, does God cry? That's ascribed to his humanity. Um, that explanation was fraught with problems, it seemed to me, if Strobel says. If you do that, wouldn't you end up with a schizophrenic Jesus? I asked, kind of a Nestorian. We've talked about Nestorius before in Bible study. Uh, it's easy to slip into that unwittingly, he replied, but all the confessional statements have insisted that both Jesus' humanity and his deity remained distinct, yet they were embodied in one person. So you want to avoid uh, a solution in which there um, are essentially two minds, sort of a Jesus human mind and a Christ heavenly mind. However, this is one kind of solution and there may be something to it. Um, it's not, uh, it's not that way. It's, and, it's, and, and believe me, people have tried every permutation over the centuries. Uh, human mind versus uh, 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 deity or divine mind. Uh, human spirit versus divine spirit. Uh, human, there's, there's every possible permutation. Somebody somewhere has already tried to carve up uh, Jesus. And every single one of those attempts has been rejected by the church at some point um, as heresy so that you can only really say Jesus is true God and true man, that the divinity communicates through the humanity, not the reverse. The humanity in no way stops the divinity. Um, and that it is okay to talk about Jesus uh, to, in ways that say, according to his humanity, this, according to his divinity, that. It's also okay to, okay to, to ascribe to Jesus anything he did according to one nation or one one. Um, entity or the other, one, one nature or the other, ascribe all of that to Jesus on the whole. So G Jesus weeps, not just the humanity weeps, Jesus weeps. Jesus walks on water, not just the divinity walks on water, Jesus walks on water, like that. Um, you know, or to say, and, and, and the reverse also is true, as I mentioned, you could say, according to his divinity, he doesn't know the day or hour, right? Um, but according to his divinity, he's true God. So, yes, Michael. Um, can't hear you. You're muted. Sorry, terrible habit. Um, right. Easy to I do. just wanted to talk about the flip side of that coin, where in Christ, the human, the divine can do human things. We can, God has a mother. God dies. God weeps. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's part of you can ascribe what Jesus does according to his humanity to the whole Jesus. That's right. God died. God can't die, but God died, but, but God can't die. You know, the father didn't die. The spirit didn't die. The son died. The son was incarnate. The son died. So God died, even though God can't die. Yeah, absolutely. God has a mother. Theotokos is the term used for Mary. God bearer. You know, she gave birth to God. Um, that does not mean that she gave birth to the father. It does not mean she gave birth to the spirit. In fact, it doesn't mean she gave birth to the only begotten of eternity, but rather gave birth to the God man, Jesus. But nonetheless, she's Theotokos. She's the God bearer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I know it's probably not the time. I know we have limited time, but I think it's worth at least mentioning here that all of the things that you've just been talking about with respect, and I'm not sure who this Warfield guy is, but I'm sure that uh, I'm sure he's yeah. well respected and all, but in, in Lutheran circles, we have um, a, a pretty distinct view of Christology and we have, uh, you know, the, the three Gaini or the, the, the Gainuses of Christ, um, the Gainus Idiomaticum, the Gainus Myostaticum, yeah. the Gainus Apotelismaticum, specifically to describe that. And, yeah. and like you said, it is not inappropriate to, um, to, to look at the things that Christ does, because he does everything in his ministry, in his life, and, and in his work in our lives for a reason. And, yeah. and typically the way that we work around that is like you were saying, to say with respect to his divinity, with respect to his humanity, um, you know, this aspect of his humanity, that aspect of his divinity, um, things that he as, as God and as the son of God, the incarnate word um, chooses to um, manifest or not with respect to his majesty and um, you know, and, and it is, it is complicated and weird. And, you know, if you're out there and, and kind of like, how do you even, you know, how do you even conceive of, of, you know, what Christ is and, you know, what he has been in his ministry? Um, there are a lot of smart people out there. And, and like I said, Warfield, I mean, he probably comes from a particular background, but um, this, that stuff is some of the headiest stuff uh, to try and, and sort through, but all they're doing is going through, like he says, just different, different parts of scripture and saying, okay, here, you know, here's where he, you know, exposed some divinity. Here's where he expressed some humanity. Here's where he did this and that. Um, and, and like you said, I, I like the way that you said it, that it's not wrong. It's not bad to, to assess or to look at those things because they all mean something. Right. And, and that, in fact, that's where I was going uh, next with um, scholastic Lutheran theology the, uh, what we would call, uh, so genus, like type, or you know, genus um, type, genus um, apotelismaticum, whatever Jesus did, he did for your salvation, the telos or goal, ultimately, of your salvation. Whether it was according to divinity or humanity, it was done for your salvation. Of uh, the genus idiomaticum, um, he did some things in the idiom of humanity, in the idiom of divinity, and yet we say the whole Jesus did them, and those things can be ascribed to him. And also the reverse is true. Um, for example, where the scripture says we have only one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. It's not ignoring his divinity, but rather we can speak of him in that way. It's fair um, to do that. And, um, you know, of course, the myostaticum, um, that, that uh, this is where you get into the majesty, that the divinity of Christ communicated through the humanity, but not the reverse. And, and the reason why I was going there next is that at the bottom of 235, uh, they go into the Reformed, where the Reformed make their big mistake. Uh, that last, way, last line on 235, the other kind of solution is some form of kenosis, uh, which means emptying. Um, this uh, spins out of Philippians 2, where Paul tells us that Jesus being in the form of God, did not think equality with God was something to be exploited. That's the way it should be translated. But emptied himself, um, he became a nobody. This is where the reform fall down. For them, there is, in essence, a fourth uh, genus, um, a, gene, a genus canoticum, or kenosis, where they misunderstand the emptying out. We understand Jesus' humility. We would say that his uh, states of humiliation, uh, or you know, prior to the resurrection, his states of hum humiliation have to do with voluntarily withholding his divinity for the sake of the of what he was about and what he was doing. You know, he didn't go around with his glory showing because it would just flatten people, you know, but rather has uh, on the uh, the transfiguration on the mount to show a brief glimpse to those three 
particular uh, apostles. Uh, so, so they misunderstand humiliation as kenosis or emptying out, which is why the Reformed say that uh, Christ cannot be present in the Eucharist because he is physically in heaven. His flesh can't be in more than one place according to his humanity. What they're missing is uh, what kenosis is. It's humility and not, and not that his divinity somehow is, is uh, held back by his humanity. It's also a misunderstanding of the myostaticum that the divinity communicates through the humanity, but not the reverse. The humanity can't stop. And it just, it's, it's should be common sense, but it's not. Um, and it has a lot to do with, uh, with humanism and rationalism in reformed theology. But uh, if, for example, um, if, if physical material things could stop the divinity, Jesus in the flesh couldn't calm the storm because his flesh would have withheld his divinity, which would not have been able to impact the storm. Jesus couldn't do the healings. Jesus couldn't forgive sins. I mean, the whole list just unfolds uh, because if Jesus can't be present in the Eucharist because his flesh limits his divinity to heaven, then the limits of his divinity would have been present in his earthly ministry, and they simply weren't. And it seems like it, it's almost a way, and I, I'm not a, you know, a, an expert on Reformed theology, but it seems like if they have an overriding concern <clears throat> about the majesty and the sovereignty of God to the exclusion of all else, uh, it seems like one possible solution to that is to come up with a Gainus Canaticum and say, well, you know, it just wasn't, he, the, the divinity wasn't there to be affronted by this idea of, of humility because he emptied it out. So now don't worry about that because it's not there anymore. So the sovereignty of God is therefore protected because of course, if it were there, then all kinds of other things would have happened. Um, and it seems like a real stretch. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting way. I've never really thought about that before, but it's an interesting way to say, well, we're still going to protect God's sovereignty. There's no way he would, he would humiliate himself as, as the, you know, the, the God of all the universe, which he is the God of all the universe. But but it, it's interesting that that idea of subjugating his sovereignty to his overriding love and mercy is just not something that would even be on the radar, you know? Right. And Carson does um, approach an explanation of this um, toward the bottom of 236. And, and by the way, there are times when Carson can almost sound Lutheran and then frustratingly step back at the last minute and pull the pull the rug out from under you. Uh, the bottom of 230, uh, uh, well, well, close to the bottom. Say, say the, uh, the uh, last full paragraph before the partial paragraph. Uh, some have said he didn't empty himself of, of his attributes, but he emptied himself of the use of his attributes, a self-limiting type of thing. Even that's not totally correct because he knows the heart of man um, all the time. So it was sort of a limiting of his some of his attributes some of the time without a full limiting of all of his attributes. You see, there's a difference there. That's getting closer, although there are times when that was not what he was doing. Okay, Carson says that he was forgiving sins the way only God can, which is an attribute of deity. Others go further by saying he emptied himself of the independent use of his attributes. I, that's not good either. That, that, that doesn't make any sense. Um, that is, he functioned like God when his heavenly father gave him explicit sanction to do so uh, that's an Aryan God. Uh, now that's much closer. Carson says, I disagree. That's an Aryan God where the son is less than the father. And um, it, literally, uh, the difficulty is that uh, there is a sense in which the eternal son um, has always acted in line with his father's commandments. You don't want to lose that. And that's what Carson is getting at there, uh, even in eternity past, but it's getting closer. Um, so strictly speaking, he says on 237 in the second full paragraph, Philippians 2 does not tell us precisely what the eternal son emptied himself of. Yeah, it does. He emptied himself of pride. The whole, Philippians, the whole of Philippians 2 is about emptying yourself of pride and then have, uh, have this mind in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, and then uses Jesus' humility as the example that we should follow. So yeah, it does do that. Uh, he emptied himself. He became a nobody. He emptied himself of pride. Uh, some kind of emptying is at issue, but let's be frank, you're talking about the incarnation, one of the central mysteries of Christian faith. That falls short. He emptied himself um, of pride. All right, I'll tell you what, um, we're ready to kind of move on over on 238 to creator or created. Um, let's pause here, because we're at the one hour marker anyway. Let's pause here, and um, I'm going to try again 
for Bible study in the sanctuary next week on Zoom via the camera. Uh, we'll give that another try. Basically today, um, I knew Richard, because I saw him, Richard was going to stay, uh, but then we didn't, um, Jeremy, you had to run the girls home and didn't really have anybody else. So, um, and that was more a function of constant contact foiled me and the emails didn't get out. So people, some people didn't even know we were gonna do this. So we will try that um, next week in the sanctuary via the camera setup. And uh, as we encourage, begin encouraging people more and more to go ahead, um, if they're not high risk, uh, go ahead and, uh, and come back to the, uh, to the sanctuary. So yeah, we'll do that next week. So thank you so much, great job. Uh, we'll continue talking about the attributes of God and of Christ uh, next week. Um, Alicia, did you have? Yeah, hopefully I'll be back someday. <laughs> okay. Oh, you oh, to, it, to the sanctuary? Yes. Wow. I miss meeting. I miss meeting with everybody. Yeah. Are they are they letting you guys are you able to come out from the facility and come to the sanctuary? Nope. Nope. Oh, not yet, huh? We're, we're even put in quarantine if we have to leave the building to go to a doctor appointment. Right, right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hang, hang in there. You know, we pray yeah. for you every Sunday. We love you and your family, and you always will be. Yeah. Yep, yep. Absolutely. Well, let's, uh, let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we thank and praise you for the mystery of the Incarnation, where your eternal word, your eternally begotten word, uh, who is God, God the Son, was in flesh for our salvation. Um, we thank you uh, that Jesus is the tabernacle. He's the, the tent. He is where Yahweh dwells among his people, that he is the sacrifice, that he is the priest offering that sacrifice. Um, and these mysteries are too great for us to fully understand, and yet we accept them on faith, and we thank you for them. Now bless us through the rest of our day. Give us a peaceful night of rest, and grant that we would rise in the morning ready to serve you and others. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. See you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.